I just want to mention that the underwriter for today's episode is Anchor Podcast Platform. Uh, these are the free podcast people that uh, will help you or anybody who wants to start a podcast. They'll get you going and they'll put you on all the platforms from Spotify to Apple and Google, Stitcher, and they do it for free. They don't charge you a dime. I mean, this is all about the democratization of audio so that everybody can have a voice online like this. And they've supported me in getting my podcast started. And for that, I'm grateful. Great state, what state am I in? Compass roses bloom again. Home of the water, Canada's daughter. Cradled in a crescent moon grin. Michigan and again and again and again and again. Michigan and again and again and again and again. I miss Michigan. I used to be there all the time. Grew up there. Founded my own alternative newspaper. Was an elected official. Did everything. I miss my parents. They're gone now. My father passed away. Jeez. It'll be... Wow, it'll be six years next month. That doesn't seem possible. My mother went before him. I miss my sisters. They're, they're still with us. But they live 3,000 miles away on the other coast. It was a great place to grow up looking at the map of the states that have the coronavirus, how many cases on the news today. I noticed Michigan still isn't listed as, as having any. And I said to one of my, my sisters on the phone, I think that uh, that goes back to my old theory that being a peninsula, Michigan, actually two peninsulas, we're separated from the rest of the world by large bodies of water. And nobody, nobody ever passes through Michigan. You don't go through Michigan to get from one place to the other, unless you're changing planes in Detroit. That, and I think that over the years, over maybe even the centuries, that kept people in Michigan sort of isolated, which had its good qualities and bad qualities. But I guess if you lived in Canada, a certain part of southwestern Ontario, you could come through Michigan if you wanted to get to Chicago or some other place in the United States. But if you were an American... You never drove through Michigan to get to anywhere unless you were going to Michigan. And that isolation has probably kept people in Michigan from contracting the, uh, the coronavirus or the fact that the state of Michigan has been so beaten down, so affected by the big stick Hundreds of thousands of people over the last 30 plus years, 40 years really now, losing their jobs, losing, losing everything. I can't tell you how many people I know that because of unemployment, it ended their marriage. It, it ended their lives. Alcoholism, drug abuse suicide, the utter despair and misery of just trying to, to get by. And it's, it's such a, it's such a crime in some way, because look at what we gave the rest of the country. Because our fathers and grandfathers, grandmothers fought the companies, formed unions, had the first sit-down strikes back in the 30s, gave us this, created, that took the working class into a class that didn't exist before called the middle class. Before the uprisings in Flint and Detroit and, and then elsewhere as they spread across the country in the, in the mid to late 30s, they fought these companies they fought the owners of the coal mines. And what they got was a chance to live. 
an income that they could live on. A day off, which they'd never had before. The ability to go see a doctor if they got sick. The chance to send their children to college, something unheard of. You know, my sisters and I, we we all went to college. I dropped out after a year or so. They didn't. They completed. They got degrees and became the first in our family to have gone to college and and received a a degree, a four-year degree. That, That had never happened before. Uh, I think I've mentioned this before on previous podcasts. I mean, here we were. Our, our, our dad worked on the assembly line at General Motors. Our mom was a secretary. And we never paid a dime to go to the doctor. We never paid a dime to go to the dentist. If we needed glasses, that was free. If you worked in the factory, you had four weeks paid vacation in addition to the two weeks off at, over the Christmas holidays. <sighs> I miss all that. I'm not the only one. So many people miss it. So many people in Flint and Detroit and Saginaw and Bay City and Lansing and Kalamazoo. Down river. All had a good life. At least had a decent life. At least had a chance. And now, now here we are, tomorrow, once again, Michigan, this forgotten state. Yeah, I was going to say one of the reasons that maybe we don't have any. Um, cases of the coronavirus that have been acknowledged is because like most things to do with Michigan, um, it's forgotten and left behind. It doesn't have the money, doesn't have the resources, is never given the resources. The way Flint has been left to just suffer. And I took the risk in, in my last film of of showing how even the Democratic Party and the Democratic officials ignored what the Republican governor had done to Flint by poisoning the water. And yet the Obama-Biden administration, we needed the Army Corps of Engineers to come in and dig up the pipes and replace all the pipes in the city of Flint. And we couldn't get their attention. And when President Obama finally came, we thought he was coming to the rescue. And instead, he came and told everybody it was okay to drink the water. And then fake drank water himself. Water that we were then later told came from Air Force One. But he made it look like it came from the school that he was speaking at. Except the water had been turned off the year before in that school. Because the water was poisoned. They turned all the water off. All the water fountains. The water in the kitchen. Everything. I think possibly the only water that worked was the water in the toilets to flush the toilets because, well, the kids wouldn't maybe be touching the toilet water. So that was okay. He came there. He told, he told us and he, and he, and he had the governor introduce, he had the governor speak first in that high school gymnasium. It was so stunning to everyone in Flint. This is five months before the election between Trump and Hillary. The month before that, Hillary had come to participate in a CNN debate with Bernie Sanders on the stage of Whiting Auditorium in Flint. And they had all these these mothers of the poisoned children lined up at the microphone to ask questions. And little did they know that the questions that they were going to ask, because they had to submit the questions in advance, as you do have to in a free society. Um, they submitted them to CNN, and then CNN, or more specifically, I guess, Donna Brazil, a CNN commentator, gave 
the questions to Hillary in advance so that she would know she'd have time to formulate an answer. Bernie Sanders didn't get the questions. He'd have to think of his answer on his feet right on the spot. And a month later, President Obama comes and drinks the water that isn't Flint water. And then I think a week or so after that, it was revealed that the questions that Hillary was asked, she and her campaign already knew what the questions were. It was all rigged. When that came out, when that happened in Flint, first of all, I remember one of the, one of the, the mothers in the Flint uh, poisoning, uh, or what I call the, the Flint ethnic cleansing, said on, on TV or, or somewhere I saw, she said, we were used as props by the Clinton campaign. And we know what happened after that, a few months later, the election in Flint. November general election people stayed home it's estimated approximately 8,000 African American voters from Flint stayed home Hillary lost the whole state by 10,000 votes they stayed home they weren't going to vote for Trump but they certainly weren't going to participate in the system any longer the system to them was rigged it was a lie, it was a sham and it hadn't done anything to help them And to think, and this is what really hit me when I first learned of this, when we all first learned of it. I mean, the governor covered it up. It was covered up for probably I think, close to a year that the taking Flint off the water system that came from the glacial lake known as Lake Huron and then forced the people to drink from the, the polluted Flint River. I, I'm Every child... Every, first of all, everybody drank it in Flint. So everybody for that year was lead poisoned. And if you do lead poisoning with to kids that are under the age of six, it causes permanent brain damage. Permanent brain damage. There's no cure. There's no way to get rid of it. It lowers their IQ by 10 to 20 points. They have all these other behavioral and developmental issues involved with this. Nobody went to jail. The governor, still loose, no longer governor. But the new governor came in, the Democratic governor came in and said that she would fix this. She would make, she would do what needed to be done to help the people of Flint. And instead, she went back on her word. She's running around the state today endorsing and, and speaking on behalf of Joe Biden. It never stops. And when I think about tomorrow's primary election, I think, who's going to? I don't even know who will show up. People will show up. There will be people that show up. There are many who have not given up. There are many who have. Flint, Michigan, Detroit, Michigan, gave us the middle class. There was no middle class before they stood and fought for it. And once they got it, one industry after another got it. Even industries, even businesses that weren't unionized, they knew they had to, in order to compete for workers with the other industries, they had to make sure that they were paying a livable wage and that they provided some benefits, some health care, some days off, some sick pay. Eventually, all the boats rose the rising tide of unionism and better wages, better benefits made it better for people who even who weren't union members. Not as good, but better. That was the great gift from, from Michigan to this country. It spread everywhere. Not as much in the South, but through the Midwest, in the Northeast, on the West Coast, people lived a better life. And other union movements were inspired to rise up. Farm workers rose up out West. And 
in return for that gift from Michigan is life today in Flint, in Detroit, in Pontiac, in Benton Harbor, downriver, up in Saginaw, even in the rural parts of the state. In the last 15 years or so, unemployment levels have spiked as high as 14, 15, 16 percent. There just aren't jobs or there aren't decent paying jobs. A baby being born tonight in some third world countries uh, has a better chance of making it through its infancy than it does if it had been born in Detroit, Michigan. That's the thanks. I want to I want to speak to the people in Michigan who are voting tomorrow. And if you're also voting tomorrow in Missouri, Mississippi, North Dakota, Idaho, and the state of Washington. If you're voting in those states, you're welcome to listen in because I think a lot of this probably applies to you. But for me, I guess it's personal. Speaking to my fellow Michiganders. This is it. This is it. This may be our last chance to fix it, to turn it around, to have an impact. The eyes of the country, the eyes of the world are upon us here on Tuesday. Some of you will be listening to this tonight when I'm recording this on Monday night. Some will be listening to this tomorrow or today. Tuesday, March 10th, Michigan Presidential Primary Day. In some ways, I don't know what to say. I'm at a bit of a loss for words. That I would even have to be recording this is a bit bit odd to me because I think most of you already know the work that we have to do today. We have to get to the polls, and we have to get 10 other people, each of us, to the polls. We have to text them. We have to email them. We have to give them a call and remind them that they've got to get out and vote today. It hasn't even been a week, really, since Super Tuesday. Let's call it a week because it'll be a week by the end of the day. A week since Super... Before that, before last Tuesday, Joe Biden was non-existent over a phantom campaign one that I have not yet seen and I've been out on the road with Bernie and I've not seen any Biden rallies I've not seen Biden volunteers I've not seen any Biden field offices that's because they aren't any (laughs) I pointed out last week in California I mean for the whole state Bernie Sanders had 23 field offices Joe Biden had one But he won South Carolina, and that gave the machine the impetus that it needed to get everybody on board. And boy, did everybody get on board quickly. Uh, Last Tuesday, Joe won a a string of states that uh, that Biden, Joe Biden, will not win. And actually, Bernie Sanders won't win them either on November 3rd this year with the exception of Virginia, Massachusetts, and, um, and uh, Minnesota. The rest of the states that he won, North Carolina, Tennessee, Arkansas, Alabama, Oklahoma, Texas. These are the states that Trump won and probably will get win again. I mean, I hope not, but I think that, I think everybody pretty much agrees on that. It was impressive that Joe Biden won in Virginia and Massachusetts and Minnesota and and Maine, half of Maine. You know, they they get to do their electoral college differently in Maine and Nebraska. They go by congressional districts, not the not the entire state together. So within a week, everything seemed to turn around. Uh, The other candidates who were running for president have endorsed Joe Biden. I think there's at least 10 or 11 of them by now. Uh, 
all the top candidates have, uh, including uh, Kamala Harris and Cory Booker in the last uh, couple of days. Everybody got behind Joe Biden. Nobody waited to see if, if he was really the best candidate who could beat Trump. Nobody waited until there was a, a debate. There will be no debate. There has been no debate before the people of Michigan and Washington and Idaho and Missouri and Mississippi get to vote here. But, um, so they, so everybody's kind of flying blind here. I can tell you in my gut and in my heart of hearts that, um, uh, Joe Biden will have a difficult time beating Trump. I believe it can happen, but not as easily as I believe Bernie could beat Trump. Somehow, you know, I think that those of us with Bernie, um, as hard as we've worked and as all the great things that have happened, more volunteers in any campaign, more, um, more donations from average everyday contributors, um, winning, uh, the first three primary caucuses, um, all of that being ahead for the last month or so until this past week in the nationwide polls. Being number one with Latino voters, being number one with um, young adult voters, all of that. But I think people are afraid. And to them, Biden seems like the safe choice. I think he's anything but the safe choice. He represents a return to the old, the old way of doing things, old politics. His main promise in the last couple of weeks has been, and I'm quoting him, uh, there will be no fundamental changes. There will be no fundamental changes during the Biden presidency. So that's, what's that taking us back to? We need some serious fundamental changes or we're not going to make it. The planet's not going to make it. Young people are not going to have a future. No fundamental changes. And and the things that Biden has said two months ago when he said that, that he couldn't guarantee that he would endorse or support Bernie Sanders if he were the nominee. In other words, if all the people through all these primaries had decided that Bernie should be the nominee, he would not commit to voting for him. Which means what he was saying was he'd rather have Donald Trump than Bernie Sanders. He had to eventually walk that back. Hillary had said the same thing. Not sure. Not sure if I could endorse him if he were the nominee. Whereas Bernie has said over and over again that he would endorse Biden or whoever the nominee was going to be. Has never equivocated from that position. And then when Biden said, when asked, would he, would he pick a vice presidential uh, candidate for himself? that was a Republican. And he said, yes, of course he would consider that. Wow. After what we've all been through in the last three years. And then, and then yesterday, him saying that he was floating some ideas of cabinet members he would have. And he suggested possibly the person he would pick to run the economy would be Jamie Dimon, the, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase Manhattan Bank. I couldn't believe it, but I do believe it because that's essentially who he is. He's supported by those 60 billionaires and they've come around and circled around him and he's their candidate because he's the, he's the best hope that there won't be real change, real change, meaning upsetting the status quo so that they can't continue to live the life they've been living. These rich people, they'd rather stay with Trump than Bernie Sanders be president. It's how frightened they are of him. And so we've had to listen to the constant drumbeat from the pundit class for the last few months. First they were for Biden, then they were against Biden. 
then they were, some of them got on board with Mayor Pete. I mean, he had up to almost 40 billionaires endorsing him at one point when he was ahead there in Iowa. Then they turned on him. Then they, then they all of a sudden got behind Bloomberg. Bloomberg was one of them. Bloomberg had the money to beat Trump. Bloomberg looked like he could beat Trump in, in their eyes. And then Elizabeth Warren, with one question, one question at the first debate, put a stake in the heart of his campaign, and that was the end of that. Whew. All of a sudden, everybody pulls back from Bloomberg. Now, where are we going to go? Where are we? Gonna, Bernie wins Nevada. Oh no! After I, so, Bloomberg's got a stake in his heart. Uh, Biden is number. What was he in? You know, he's. He was on some of these polls. He was like fourth or fifth at this point. Mayor Pete had stalled. They didn't know where to go. It certainly wasn't going to be Bernie. Yet here's Bernie, number one. He's 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 won three contests in a row. And then South Carolina came along and saved Joe Biden. And then they all quickly, and boy, they are so good. They smartly, they got behind him so quick and they they called Klobuchar and they called Buttigieg and they called Beto. And I don't know what was said. I don't know what was offered or promised, but you know you're not stupid. We've all lived long enough. It wasn't just a howdy. Oh, hi. Hi. Yeah, you want me to support Joe? Sure. No, that's not what happened. No. No, they worked the phones that they've been working. They've been made. They were pulling in favors. They were making promises. They were doing it in all the right way. You got to give them credit for this. The reason the status quo is called the status quo, why it remains the same, why those in power remain in power, why the rich stay rich and get even richer is because they know how to do this, man. <laughs> they're not sitting around worried about the poisoned water that they might be drinking because let me tell you, they're not drinking it. I heard Anand say the other day that he he doesn't think he sat on any of those pundit tables on cable news. He doesn't believe he's ever sat next to somebody um, who didn't have health insurance. And you could expand that to a whole bunch of things. I've been on these shows. I've never sat next to anybody um, who wasn't able to come and do the show with me because they didn't have child care. I don't think they've ever sat me down on a, sh on a cable show next to somebody who made $7.25 an hour or somebody whose wages were currently being garnished because they couldn't afford to pay the hospital bill under Obamacare. No. No. The people in charge and the media and all the other tentacles that extend from the seat of power. They are not you. Now they made the calls. They called in all the favors. They made all the promises. They lined everybody up around Joe. This isn't just me surmising or um, kind of fantasizing about how this all came together in the last week. I know it from personal experience. I'm going to tell you something that I have not told anybody. Um, and I've really been waiting to tell you. You're welcome to share this with other people. I got a call. That's right. I got a call from somebody um, on behalf of the former vice president to see if I'd be willing to, to come on over, support the vice president. It was time to give up on Bernie and move. Now, I got to pause right now. You're right. You're thinking, wait a minute. Are you, wait, no, 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 no. They called you? Like, I'm the last person you'd call, right? I haven't spoken to any of the other surrogates for Bernie or any of the other n people with, who are, you know, known people. People are known to the public. Um but man, if they called me, they must have called the rest of you. <laughs> this is like, <laughs> yeah, at the end of, at the end of the week here, 
suggesting it's time to to give up on Bernie. It was over. We want you to to come over, support Joe. You know, we've heard you say how you you've uh, been in the room with him. You like him. He likes you. He loves your films. Come on, Mike. <laughs> wow. I have to say that in my lifetime has never happened. In other words, uh, a campaign that clearly knows that I do not support them. And the only thing I've said really is that I've said whatever all the other Bernie surrogates have said, and Bernie has said, whoever the nominee is, whoever's on the ballot in November with a D by the name, that's who we're voting for because we're going to remove Donald J. Trump. Bernie said it. I said it. Everybody said it. Everybody at least who's working or helping the campaign has said it. That's it, though, because we're not stopping with Bernie. We're going all the way. And none of us have given any indication that we think any differently than that. And yet the call was made. Now, if they're calling me, you know, and I'm, look, I'm just, a, I'm not, a, I'm, I wasn't one of the Democratic candidates on that stage. But that, but when I look around the state of Michigan and I see the various local political people that they've called and they've got behind Joe Biden, various mayors, county, uh, county commissioners, um, people who are married to county commissioners. Um, it's amazing. It's like the floodgates have opened. They've got everybody and anybody that they can to get lined up behind Joe Biden. They couldn't get me, though. I'm sorry they didn't know that. I'm sorry they had to waste their dime. It's not really a dime anymore. It's kind of so many minutes. It's a free call. <laughs> but they got a lot of other people. That's how it works, folks. That's how it works. I've seen it over my lifetime. I certainly have seen it. I've heard of it. I was even going to bring this up back when Bloomberg had jumped in and was spending all those millions of dollars. Um, I wanted to out some of the people in the documentary filmmaking community um, who were helping Bloomberg. I think they were doing it quietly, but they were being paid. That even people that I know that make documentary films, that they have their price and if it's about the do-re-mi, they will pick the do-re-mi. And I thought, boy, I never thought that would happen. I just thought, I thought, man, this is how Bloomberg is going to do it. If he can even buy people who make documentaries to work for him, to do this work because the pay was so good, or political activists I know that had received calls, black political activists, people who were very active in the, in the black community being offered money, Lots of money in various states. You may have read some of the stories about that. And of course, all the ones I know of, <laughs> just like laugh them off. Became a good story to tell over dinner. And I will admit, I, I have dined out a little bit this past week <laughs> on the crazy phone call on Friday to come on over. Come on, Mike. Joe likes you. That doesn't make me feel good, you telling me that. He should not like me. <laughs> wow. Wow. You know they're going deep. They're going real deep when they've reached me. I'm just this side of, of calling a Canadian for help, which would be illegal. But... I'm just the side of a Canadian or a Cuban. The Biden campaign has been calling Cubans in Cuba to help with the campaign. <laughs> Man. Wow. The whole thing, it's just rigged, isn't it? It's rigged and it's funded with all that money. And it's run, it's run on fear also. Not just the fear that they're trying to instill in the voters. 
that if you vote for anybody else other than Joe Biden, Trump will get another four years. It's run on their own fear, their fear of Bernie, their fear of what if people actually, when they got sick, went to a doctor and got help and didn't, didn't go bankrupt as a result of it. Wow. What would that world look like to them? They wouldn't like that world in part because they'd have to pay for it with their taxes. The rich people, the business owners, they'd have to pay for that help for the sick people. But there's also something that helps. They think it helps them. The more you keep a population sick or filled with mental anxiety, stress, coming unglued, the more you debilitate them and demoralize them, the harder it is for them to coalesce with each other and fight you. That's why it benefits those in power for the masses not to have free health care, not to have free daycare so that they now can maybe take a few classes or go out and have an evening to relax and enjoy life. That's why they want you students in debt at age 22. So you'll shut the fuck up, get a job, obey the rules. Don't think of organizing a union here. You got a student loan you've got to pay off this month. You've got a bill coming every month and you better get a job. It doesn't matter if you like the job or not. It doesn't matter if that's why you went to school for that particular job. Keep your head down. Obey. Obey. No, this system we have, this benefits the very people that that either want Trump in the White House or if they don't get Trump, at least if they've got Joe Biden, they can guarantee that, that they're the little scam that they run on everybody gets to continue. The way that they've locked up millions of black and brown people all the things that benefit the way they see the world, the way they want the world to exist. My friends in Michigan, throughout this great state, I don't know what to say. I know you're feeling the same way. I know a lot of you are probably thinking, no, I know Mike, I know I, I agree with everything with Bernie, but, 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 but we gotta get rid of, we gotta get rid of Trump. And Biden looks like the typical kind of politician we're, you know, we're used to. And he can do it. Yeah, but he, he does. He looks like Hillary. He looks like Dukakis. He looks like Mondale. He looks like Kerry. He looks like Gore. It's the same DNA. And we lose. We lose every single time with that DNA. We've only won twice in the last... 30 years and both times it was with an outsider a hillbilly from from Arkansas raised by a single mom a night nurse and a black man from God knows where (laughs) Hawaii Indonesia Kenya Kansas (laughs) whose middle name was Hussein. That's how we won. We won with an outsider. Something fresh and different, bold, imaginative, risky, dangerous. Jeez, I don't... Clinton, when he ran, didn't he lose? He lost the the first three primaries. Maybe he lost the first five. I I think the first time he came in number one was in Georgia. That's how we've won in the past. Biden is the way we lose. But I don't think there's anything I can say to convince you of that. And I'm not going to feel good because I told you back in March that it was really risky to put Joe Biden up against Donald Trump for a whole host of reasons. Not just because he was the same old, same old politician that we've lost with so many times in these last three decades. 
not just because um, Trump is going to go to town on him, whether it's with his son, with Biden's son, whether it's using Biden's, what did, what did they call it the other day, um, his cognitive decline? I'm not talking about the gaffes and the, the cutesy mistakes and all that. You know what I'm talking about. I was on one of the talk shows this past week. I said to the host afterwards, what do you think of this, this cognitive decline thing? Uh, not one of the hosts, but one of the people that was on the, was in the studio. He said, oh yeah, that's real. I said, you, you think it's real? Oh yeah, big time, he goes. Oh, well, um, hmm. Think we should do something about that? Say something? No. They'll get a, they'll get a good VP for him. Some a good smart brainiac woman, um, and people will be satisfied with that as long as he doesn't do anything too crazy. <laughs> as long as he doesn't do anything too crazy. Are you serious? This is what we're going into battle with. I heard somebody say yesterday on the one of the cable shows that yeah that. The people, the Demo people on the Democratic side, they 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 believe that Biden is the is the soldier they want to be with when they go into battle. Um, and I wanted to say, okay, uh, yeah, that may be true, but uh, he's not the soldier; he's the general. Is that the general you want to be with? Is this the strategist? Is this the genius that's going to defeat the forces of evil on November third? Wow. My friends, especially my friends here in Michigan, um, we have a job to do right now. We've saved this country before. We saved it from the wealthy class that was going to continue to use us as fodder in their machine when we fought them and we defeated them in the 30s we saved this country when when all of our parents and grandparents great grandparents went to work in the auto factories in the steel factories during world war ii and helped build the machine that was needed to be built to defeat fascism and then in the 50s and 60s we were the ones that built this middle class and made it so attractive that the threat of everybody belonging to a union was so great that those in power knew they had to give these things also to the people that didn't have unions or they would unionize their facilities. And we made life better for everybody. Well, not everybody. When I say that, I think something because I'm thinking, you know, UAW is very different than a lot of the other unions. The UAW was very aware of the racist country that we live in. And so very early on in the 40s and 50s, uh, insisted, contractually insisted, that the assembly line not be segregated, where the black workers were put down in the foundries to do all the shitty backbreaking work where they don't live as long, that every part of the factory had to be integrated. And it was. They led that they led that fight long before it was popular with other unions. You could look at the march on, on, on Washington with Martin Luther King in 1963. And there's the U you see all these UAW signs. You see the founder of the UAW, Walter Ruther, marching there with Martin Luther King right at the front. So when I say life was good in Flint. I meant in many ways, if you belong to a union, if you belong to the UAW, if you were an auto worker, life was good. But life has not been good for African Americans who still occupy the lowest rung on the economic ladder. They and Native Americans together still still shat upon by this by this racist power structure. 
and we've let this go, go on way too long. You know, here I'm thinking, boy, oh, I can't believe the way the way these corporate Democrats have been able to twist this thing on Bernie this week. Oh, he, he, he canceled his rally in Jackson, Mississippi. Yeah, because he was needed in, in Detroit. Bernie Sanders, who marched with King on that day in 1963, as a 20-year-old college student, he was there at the march, at the March on Washington. And weeks before that, getting arrested in Chicago at a civil rights demonstration, He's lived his whole life like this. I called Jesse Jackson a week or two ago to encourage him to endorse Bernie. I, I was really hoping that he could do that. And he did do that this past weekend and went to Michigan with Bernie at a rally in Grand Rapids. And Jesse said to me, he said, you know, when I ran for president back in 84 and 88, no white elected officials would endorse me. There were many white people that endorsed me, he said, including you, Mike. <laughs> um, you know, we worked so hard. We, he, he won the Michigan primary, Jesse Jackson. Um, very proud moment. But he said, you know, white elected officials would not endorse me, except for Bernie Sanders, except for the mayor of Burlington, Vermont, not a large black population in Burlington, Vermont. And here was the white mayor endorsing him. He said, I've never forgotten that. And Bernie has stayed true to who he was and is to this day. I'm not surprised that Jesse came out and endorsed Bernie this weekend. When I first went down to meet with Bernie's staff, his campaign staff at the campaign headquarters in Washington, D.C. a number of months ago, went into this room, there's a big table, and everybody who had a job with the campaign, whether they were the campaign manager, in charge of the publicity, marketing, polling, um, outreach, grassroots. I think I was the only white, pr myself and, and his chief strategist, Jeff Weaver, I think we were the only white people sitting at the table. I'm not kidding. Campaign manager, Faz, he's Muslim. Um, there was the uh, his communications people, his his uh, his press secretary, Brianna, African Americans, Latinas, um, Native Americans. I mean, everybody was in the room. Arab Americans, Asian Americans, Muslims, Jews. Maybe one or two Christians were there. I mean, it was all there. It was an amazing thing to see. This isn't the window dressing that other candidates use. These were the actual, the brain trust of the Sanders campaign was the big melting pot of America right in that room. I don't think I've ever been in a room like that, somebody running for office. So... Here we are. What are you going to do? If you live in the state of Washington today, Idaho, North Dakota, Missouri, Mississippi, and Michigan, vote. Take five people with you. Make it a party. Make it a lunch. Take your I Voted sticker with you home. Plan something for tonight. Plan a party. Everybody who's got an I Voted sticker come to the party. Here's our chance. Maybe you don't live in those states, but you know people that live in those states. Call them, text them, email them. Remind them to vote. Vote for Bernie. The Working Families Party, which had endorsed Elizabeth Warren yesterday, endorsed Bernie Sanders, as did a number of other prominent uh, people who had supported Elizabeth This is our only chance. We will we will continue to live the way we're, we're living now, either for the next four years with Trump, or we'll go back to living the way it was before Trump, which really wasn't all 
that great, but at least it was without Trump. I get that. We'll go back to that and we'll live that way for another four to eight years. Or we could move toward a better America. Well, I got to tell you, I would not be encouraging you to vote uh, for Bernie if I thought he was not able to defeat Trump. That would be the worst thing because we have to get rid of Trump. And I think Bernie will crush Trump. I, not only in the debate, in fact, I think Trump will be afraid to debate him. You need a Bernie or an Elizabeth to take down a Bloomberg or a Trump. You know that. I don't have anything else to say. I am weary. I am exhausted. I know there I have many fans and many people listening to this podcast that don't don't support Bernie. I hear from you. Thank you. By the way, thanks for sticking with me. Um, I do the same for you. Seriously, I have I have respect for everybody who's been out there doing anything to stop Trump, regardless who your candidate has been uh, uh, this past year. God bless you for it. I do love you for it. Um, there's no animosity or. Uh, ill will whatsoever. Um, and I know most of you feel the same way toward me. We're all, we all want the same thing here. Even the people who are for other candidates, even the people who are for Biden want health care for all Americans that want our jails to be emptied of people who are of a certain color, who committed nonviolent crimes and are locked up for long periods of time. I know you want that. I want. You, I know you want an end to that. I know you want an end to that. You're good people. All the exit polls have shown. It's so funny how Bernie has, if he hasn't won the primary, he's won, he's won the race of ideas. The majority of Democrats coming out of those polls say they support Medicare for all. They support doubling the minimum wage. They support ending mass incarceration. They support daycare and these other things that we need. Free college tuition. On some level, the majority, vast majority, support these things. But they have different candidates in mind. That's how it rolls, I guess, right? I'm sitting here in my podcast room, my little studio here that we built and I'm looking over, and I see the reel-to-reel tape recorder that my parents gave me for Christmas when I was in fourth grade. This tape recorder that I just, I went everywhere with, lugging it around. Big thing. It's not one of those little portable things. I didn't, they had invented the portable tape recorder yet. This was this big, this is something like you'd see in the office on, on, uh, on Mad Men or <laughs> whatever. It was... Um, it was a wonderful gift and I started recording everything with it and here I am at this age my parents gone still talking into a microphone still hoping it makes a difference that it matters on some level underneath that reel-to-reel tape recorder over on the shelf there is the 16 millimeter camera that shot Roger and me my first film French camera hmm <laughs> And on the shelf below that, one of the one of the most wonderful prizes that I've received for my films, first place at the Tehran Film Festival, Tehran, Iran, and it sits there as a a reminder of how I'm supposed to hate them, the Iranians. Once the Cold War was winding down. Roger me. Roger me came out right during when the the Berlin Wall was coming down during those months and all the other things and we hadn't it wasn't released in theaters yet. My buddy Rod and I we went over to East Germany and was invited to the Leipzig Film Festival in East Germany and we landed in Berlin and what on West Berlin and we were going to stay a night there and we heard that there were people down at the wall chiseling and we went down there and we joined in and we stayed there 
couple days or so to chisel away at the wall. The wall hadn't come down yet, and the police and the army were trying to keep everybody away from the wall on both sides, and then it just was useless. We stayed until we got till we created a hole in the wall. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Cold War was over. We had to have new enemies. Iranians, Muslims, Arabs, terrorists. The real terror was still at home. The real terror was in Flint, in Detroit, in Milwaukee, in Philly, in the south side of Chicago, in Newark, in Harlem, in Brooklyn, in Watts, in El Paso. The real terror. We still have a chance to put a stop to some of this. To stand up and fight and have our voices heard. Please do that. Do it in whatever way you need to do it. And by that I mean whatever candidate. We're down, we're down, I guess we're down to two. You know what I believe, what I stand for. Have your voice heard. To those of you in Michigan, I know a lot of you have given up. I don't blame you on some level. You have every right to be upset. If there's any, any ounce of spirit left in you, though, if you can hear through this device that you're listening to me on right now, if you can hear my hand reaching out to your hand, to grab your hand with me together. Together. I'm not giving up. I'm not going anywhere. You don't have to give up. You don't have to be erased. Michigan. We used to mean something. We still do. No matter how beaten down, no matter how poisoned, no matter what that feels like with the boot on the neck, I and thousands, millions of others are here to help take that boot off your neck. And really, I can't sleep in peace until I know that has happened and that you and I and the millions of others, we, the people, run this country. We can do this today. We can remove Trump in November and we can build a better country. Let's do this. Let's rumble. Michigan and again and again and again and again. Michigan.